stories that matter. The journey of life from birth to death is an extraordinary trip, sometimes filled with great joy and excitement, but at other times filled with pain, sorrow, and disappointment. Stories That Matter shares both extremes with you. Sometimes our stories will make you feel very happy, but the journey of life is not all happiness. Other times, the journey of life will make you feel sad, for all of us have experienced both extremes. Stories That Matter will begin right after the break with a story that will touch your heart in the journey of life. Welcome to Stories That Matter. I'm your host, Doug Thompson, with my special guest, John Welsh. And John, John's been a friend of mine since uh, we were in high school together. Eight or nine of our best years, wasn't it? Yes, that? correct. <laughs> <laughs> well, John, you have a story today, and you are what they call uh, at the VA uh, the Miracle Man or the Wonder Man. Yes. Yeah. And so tell me about your story. I know you were working out, uh, your name, of course, is John Welsh, and uh, your family used to own uh, Easy Jack, still does own Easy yes, Jack. Your yes, dad's gone yes, now. And yes. your, your brother, Jamin, runs Run, that now. Yeah, he runs it for us right now. Okay. And then uh, you were working up there one day on the back lot area. Yes, I was working around the lagoon system. Uh, we were trying to get it mobile, just clean up, you know, so it was more presentable. And we were cutting some trees, and uh, one of them was cut and, and kind of looked like it was going to go the direction it needed to, and a wind come up. I'd walked down and looked at the cut on the tree, and everything looked fine. Well, when I was walking back up the side of the lagoon, I heard it snap off. And, of course, it did, and then I was down. When you heard uh, it, then it fell yeah, on you? all of a sudden, yeah, because I was still walking up the hill. W had you cut the tree? No. No, okay. somebody else was. But you thought it was headed on. a different direction, so it wasn't yeah. really of a great concern to no, you when no, you heard that initial snap. Yes. And then the next thing you know, you were on the ground. Yes. Okay, then what happened? Well, I basically laid there and tried to get my breath back. I couldn't move. Uh, lucky enough, the tree wasn't on top of me. It had knocked me down, and according to what uh, my brother Jamin had saw, the tree had a Y in it. And evidently, when this tree snapped off, it turned, and that's why it come over in my direction. Otherwise, it would have fell the direction it was supposed to. And when it took me down, then it picked me back up as the tree rolled and threw me down in a pile of, of uh, limbs that I'd been cutting on another tree. Sort of got and even with you, huh? Yeah, got even with me, and there I laid. <laughs> yeah. Nowhere to go, couldn't move. And you had some bad injuries. And I had some bad injuries. What were they? What we found out in the emergency room was I had uh, on my right side, all my ribs were broken and my lung was collapsed. I had three fractures in my spine, in my lower back, and two of them were compressed. And then I had my fibula bone mm -hmm. was shattered about two inches down from where it turns the head down toward the on the ball uh, and then below that headed down yeah to the, it comes out and then it heads down to right. the knee and about two and inches from the two joint two inches from that uh. is where and the doctor said that it was a, a real bad break because it broke it like you'd break cane it didn't break it across it was just like you snap cane yeah. how it shattered yeah, splinters yes yeah. so so to fix the situation they had to run a rod down through that bone and it's got two screws anchored to my knee and then it's anchored into my pelvis. Well there isn't anything and sounds then, good about it. No, <laughs> all of that. No. What about the what about on your uh, your spine? Because that's a pretty serious area. For some reason it's healed up good. I mean it's I have some problems. Uh, I don't have a lot of pain anymore. Um, you know, I I have no answer. I really don't. For I that. understand. But I did I did uh, they had a two-piece brace that I would have to wear, even in my hospital bed. If I got up over like 23 degrees, then I'd have to have that brace on. So somebody, one of the nurses would have to be in there or somebody to put that brace on me to get me out of the hospital bed into the wheelchair. And then I got to where I was moving around. And I think that probably Probably helped me you wanting some. to get out of that bed and go home kind of sure I, think I bet it did helped a lot and uh, you're a Vietnam veterans right there yes. on your shirt and I know I was at a ceremony the other day that uh, 
uh, you, you got one of the quilts for your service in Vietnam. What did you do in Vietnam? I was in the first and 83rd field artillery. We were, we were on the big guns, the 8 inch and 175s. They were self propelled guns. I was on most of the fire bases uh, up on the, around the DMZ, up yeah. around Dong Ha, uh, Phu Bai Way. Uh, you were lobbing the big shells. Yeah. yeah. So they, what, helicopters and airplanes would call in coordinates exactly. to support the ground troops? Yes. And then you were launching? Yes. Uh, consistent with the coordinates? Yes. Very, very consistent with the very, coordinates? Very, very consistent. <laughs> you that was an exact, <laughs> exact mark for yes. you. Yes. And I know you and I were talking before, uh, and I asked you, I said, were you able to wear a hearing protector? You said, no. No. No hearing because you got to absolutely understand the coordinates. Exactly. And, uh, and I understand that. How long were you in Vietnam? Oh, let's see, I went over, well... Is it a 13-month tour altogether? It was 12 months, and I think I was like around 10 and a half months. Uh, we went into Laos, Laos, or yeah, however right. you want to pronounce uh -huh, it. Right. And uh, right after uh, enemy fire up in there, then we were deactivated. My unit was deactivated. Okay. We're going to so. take a little break, and when we come back, we're going to continue talking with John Welsh with Stories That Matter. <music> Welcome back to Stories That Matter. I'm your host, Doug Thompson, with my special guest, John Welsh. John, we were just talking about a couple of things before we cut away to break. Uh, of course, you were talking about out at Easy Jack's, your dad's place, property that you, you and your family own now, that you were cutting a tree at the lagoon, and somebody else had cut one tree, and it fell unexpectedly a different direction and it landed on you and caused a lot of injuries to you. I mean, serious injuries. Serious, if that's yes. all this story was about, that would be a lot. But that's just the tip of the iceberg for you. And we just, then we moved into that segment in your earlier days. You were in Vietnam right after we got out of high school, shortly after, and uh, you were with the artillery unit and you were lobbing big shells in to support the ground troops. Uh, and you said that you moved over to Laos and then uh, you got deactivated and yes. you were in Vietnam about ten and a half months, ultimately got out of the service and served your country and served it well. Now let's, let's go forward because of these injuries that you suffered. What, what was the consequence of that? Obviously the injuries were disabling to you, but uh, was your treatment at the VA? Yes, at VA and Stormont Vale. Okay. Between the two hospitals. Uh, I had done about three months or maybe three and a half months at the VA in uh, rehab, uh, which they've done a real good job. Yeah. I'm sure that this is why I'm up walking right now. I'm sure it is. I remember you telling me about that part. But at that uh, procedure at Stormont Bell, they found something in your body. What was it? They found a nodule in my left lung. And what did they diagnose that it, as? It was later on diagnosed as cancer. Okay, was it uh, melanoma? Yes. A form of melanoma? It was a form of melanoma. Okay, and so when they found that, how advanced was it? When they first found it, it was about the size of a pencil eraser. And within eight months, it had grown to about the size of a half dollar. It had got to stage four. Okay, so it's a stage four cancer. Yes. You, undoubtedly, uh, see I know your sister's a nurse at, uh, at VA. Yes. She knew the severity of that. Yes, correct. You and her have conversations about it? Oh, yes. And she told you it's yes. going to be slow walking, easy music. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Did very she give correct. you, that's, that's what she told <laughs> you. Very, She's very pretty correct. blunt, so I understand that. <laughs> yes. And uh, what time frame did she tell you? Well, she really didn't know. And if she did, it's kind of one of those things that you really probably don't want right. to share with you. Unless you yeah. were the actual doctor that, yeah. you know, is really kind of has the authority to do that, even though I'm not so sure that that's a correct statement. Uh, I, I got you. I got you. <laughs> did you have conversations with the doctors about, okay, I have stage four. How do we treat it? Uh, wh where do I go from here? You're, you're no different than the people watching or than I would be with it if the doctor said, you got stage four cancer. And it's, okay, what's the options? How do we treat this? Uh, and what, what can I expect in the future? What's going to happen? And what's my time frame? Because as you and I have talked before, 
sometimes the Lord takes people and it's just like that. <laughs> I mean, and, yes. the, and other times there's a, a progression that somebody says, you know, here's what's going to happen. And uh, we all know this one that I, I don't know anybody that was born 1900 that's still here. So what that tells me is none of us are going to live forever, uh, at least in this form. And so consequently, uh, we're all going to depart. So d did the doctors give you any indication, John, about what options were available to you? No, uh, they really didn't, other than the fact of the chemo that I had uh, took. Uh, I had a life expectancy of somewhere between six months to a year. Uh, it also said in there that very few had made it four years. Uh, that's about all they really, okay. they really told me. I mean, that's, they didn't really want to deviate from what the uh, expectancy of the chemo would do. I mean, right. cause it just said it would keep you alive for a little while. Exactly. So whether it's six months on the low side, yeah. year on the high side. Yeah. Now, the VA also <coughs> kept medical records for you, and later you found out that in their records they projected you to be dead within one year, didn't they? Yes, correct. And because of that, then there were some limitations on other medical treatments you could yes, receive. Yes, there was. Correct on that? Yes, there was. Okay. That's correct. And uh, did they at some point in time offer hospice to you? Yes, they did. And so where were you in this stage when they said, John, we've done everything we can do, and we'll give you hospice to usher you on out? Yeah. Uh, I was probably at that time uh, through some of the x-rays that uh, I might have been around stage three because I think the, uh, <clears throat> that nodule had grown to about the size of a quarter and they had told me that I needed to get with hospice, which I did. Uh, I went to Manhattan, I went through the hospice. Awesome, awesome deal. I mean, Dedicated uh, people. They are, you know, mm -hmm. it, it'd be a great thing. The only thing is, <clears throat> my children, Jacob and Christina was with me. And of course, you know, I'm not ready to give up here. You know, I'm gonna continue on with something. And I, I told the lady that, you know, if it comes to the point, then I'll probably come here. But right now, I'm going back to the VA, and I'm going to ask him to do something. I don't care what it is. Yeah. You know, let's do something. Let's see what we can do. So. And did you go back? Went, yes, I did. What'd they and do? And they went to work on me. That's when <clears throat> they took uh, my uh, upper left lung lobe out. Uh -huh. The surgeon, and they had it done at Stormont Vale. And I can't remember his name right now, but he was one of their best surgeons. Right. And, and I'm real happy with what he'd done. But he told me that if he <clears throat> asked him <clears throat> to just take out the nodule, at the time, they didn't really know for sure what the cancer was because they couldn't get a biopsy done on it to VA, VA in Kansas City. So if you're going to go in there and do something like this, let's, you know, take it out. Just don't do a biopsy. Right. And then later on, Tell go you back what you and already go know. through this again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, he told me if he took out the nodule, I'd probably have about a 30% chance of surviving the cancer. He thought maybe, you know, he would the, get the it The six about months there. or a year? Yes. Okay. So he said, now, if I take out the whole upper lung lobe, he said, I got a 90% chance of increasing that time. To maybe the two years. It, maybe. Yeah. So I said, okay, well, let's do that. So we did. I went through the surgery, which is kind of a rough surgery, it really is. There's and a risk you weren't even going to survive that. Exactly. When we I want to cut away to break. When we come back, I want to talk to you about that surgery and what took place from there. We'll okay. be right back. Welcome back to Stories That Matter. I'm your host, Doug Thompson, with my special guest and my friend, John Welsh. John, you know, I should have probably said at the beginning, not only were we in high school together, but uh, we raced race cars against each other for many, many years. years and you've been, yes. a, you've been a dear friend for many years. We partied together, we've yes. done, well, I'll just leave it at that. Okay, that sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds pretty good, but okay, so <clears throat> now the, the situation is the doctor performs the surgery upon you, takes a good portion of the lung away. Yes. And like you said, that was a very, difficult procedure and there was a good chance you wouldn't even survive that. Yes, correct. But then after that surgery is completed, he says, okay, depending upon luck for you, you have six months to maybe two years maximum and that's about all that can yes. be done for you. Yes. No other treatment than that. Would that be yes. accurate? 
Yes, that's pretty accurate. Okay, so uh, at some point in time, you get released from there and you make the best recovery you can, but they're telling you that you're in that time window that any time you're going to be dying. That, am, I, am I accurate? Well, you, you tell it. Okay, after the upper lung lobe was uh, removed, uh, we thought, you know, okay, the cancer's taken care of. I'm sure we, of course, see, I hadn't even started chemo yet. So uh, probably within three weeks, two more nodules showed up in my other lung. Mm. See, then I had to start taking the chemo. At least at that time, they knew the nodule they took out, what kind of cancer it was. So then they could treat the cancer with the proper chemo. Okay. Which, uh, which I took uh, four rounds of the chemo, and that's just about enough to kill you right there at the end of that. Uh, I and, went there a couple of weeks. I couldn't even eat at the end of it. I remember yeah. when I saw you, you were pretty small. Yeah. And the whole point of that is to try to get you from for as long of a period as you can. It wasn't going to cure you. No. It was going to be maybe the maximum two years, the short side, six, six months. months. And you were past that six I months. I was past the six but months. But within the two years. Yes. Correct. Okay, then what happened? Well, then I took the chemo and and... You know, it took me down for a while, but I kind of, I got up, I just had that will to want to go and, and got up and just started getting better and better and better. And, okay. and so, so you had the chemo treatment and now you're looking at getting into the, you feel like, well, maybe I can get two years out of this. Yes, correct. Okay. And some point in time, did they change their diagnosis to you and say, that's all you got. It's going to be. There isn't anything else we can do or will do for you because you're going to get you past your six months and within two years you're going to be yeah, gone. That's that's all they could do. Okay. What they've done, I have been told that you know if it does come back, which there's a high risk of that, that there is more chemo I can take if I want. It's worth the try, isn't it? To, to prolong yes. it some more. Okay. So now let's fast forward a little bit because one day you're down at the post office and I come on in to get the mail. And I, I had heard about your accident with the tree, but I didn't know how bad it was. And we get to talking, and I, I remember walking by. And I said, John, how you doing? And, and you know, you were a little hesitant at first. It's just you and me. You remember the conversation? Yes. Yes. And I said, John, how you doing? And you said, well, not so well. And I said, well, you recovered from that tree? I didn't know the full extent of the injuries. I knew that it had broken some ribs, but I didn't know the full extent, and I certainly didn't know about the cancer. And that's when you told me, you said, well, I'm... Uh, they're recommending I go back on hospice. And, and then you said, I'm just not going to be around long, but uh, I'm going to fight as hard as I can. Is that pretty close? Yes, that's exactly. Okay, and then I remember you asking me, would you pray for me? And yes. I came back and I, I prayed for you. Yeah, and then you and I, I came out to your house. We had a visit, didn't we? Yes. And what do, you, what do you recall from that? Because I remember when I got there, you were so weak that it was tough for you to even get up. I remember hollering in, I said, John, I'll let myself in, don't worry. And you were, you were pretty weak and pretty beat. Yes, I was. Uh, well, and it said chemo, it took me down pretty bad. Yeah. And uh, I might've been in the wheelchair at that time. Oh, uh, you weren't, weren't right, right that, not that day you not weren't. Not that day, okay. But, but uh, as that process started, somewhere in there, uh, you began to ask the Lord for yes. help. Yes, How, I did. You, what'd you do? I prayed. Just asked to be saved, you know. I mean, and then I know you prayed for me, and a lot of other people were doing that, and and for some reason I started getting better. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah. I started getting better. And, and right and, now you and are. Look at me right now. You're cancer free. I'm cancer free. Yes. Stage four. Yes. No further treatment went on. Nope. And so when you go back to the VA for uh, updates, they call you. The walking miracle. The walking miracle. I and why did they do four. You beat stage four <laughs> without beat treatment. Stage four. And you give it all the credit to the Lord? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And you remember at the conversation that you had, you and I had at your house, you, I asked you, I said, John, where are you at with this? Because you know, you remember I told you, I said, not everybody gets the chance to, to, to know about when they're going to die and have the chance to, to do some things. And, I, and you and I talked about, and I told you about the story of when Jesus was being crucified and there was one thief on his left and one on the right. And I told you about that story. And I said, he, he uh, told the one on the right, he said, I tell you today, you will be in paradise with me. And I said, that guy didn't go to church before. He didn't know scriptures. He didn't know any of those things. And you and I talked and you said, I'm not sure. I don't know how to talk to the Lord. I don't know how to pray. 
and you and I talked. I said, John, you just talked to him just like you just like you would a dear friend yes. in the room, and that's what you did. Yes, wasn't I it? did. Yeah, yes, I, you, you just started talking to him, and he heard you. And as far as you're concerned, he answered your prayers. Yes, and I still talk to him quite often because uh, so I, I want to keep going. <laughs> I bet you, I bet you do. I want to keep going. And you remember, you and I talked about Lazarus. I told you about the story yes. of Lazarus, and I told you that well, you know, uh, Jesus brought him back from the dead. Uh, but Lazarus went on, had a career, and uh, he was uh, he was amazing. But he has a graveside. He died later. And you know all of us are going to well, die. That's a given. For whatever reason, the Lord has given you additional time. Why? Why do you think he's done that? You know, I really don't have that answer, but it's there. Have you, have you asked him? Not really. I think I he's know. probably waiting for you to say, hey, John, you know, I don't know why I left you here. Because <laughs> I bet he's got something in mind for you. And part of it's going to be this, some of this footage that we're doing right now, not only will this be on uh, uh, Eagle Communications, but we're also going to use some of this footage for the Good News Spectacular that's going to be September the 25th at 2 o'clock. That's a Sunday afternoon at the high school auditorium. And I know you told me that you would, you would be there, good Lord being yes. willing. And um, we're going to share some of that story because it's an amazing story. There's going to be a couple other people that the Lord has just physically reached in and said, you have asked and your faith has healed you and has given them additional time. And that's what some of the stories are going to be. We're going to cut away and take a break. And when we come back, we're going to finish this part up because it's a great story. Welcome back to Stories That Matter. I'm your host, Doug Thompson, with my special guest, John Well, John, when we cut away to break, we had just got to the point of, that you had asked the Lord to heal you. And uh, there wasn't any magic about it. You didn't do it in a church setting. It was you in your house, and you were just talking to the Lord. Yes. And you asked Him, and you prayed with Him. And I'm, I'm guessing, because you, I think you probably told me some of this before, that as you began to pray with Him, then you prayed more. Uh, often and you prayed longer and you had those conversations with him. Yes. And uh, what do you attribute your cancer-free body to? I attribute it to the Lord. Yeah. You know, it seemed like the more I would ask, the better I got. You know, I mean, that's that's really all I know. I don't have the answer, but you you have I'm the here. answer. You've <laughs> given the answer. <laughs> and we have. Uh, I had mentioned before you and I went on air that I've been talking about the healing services coming up here on September the 25th. And, uh, and it's a situation whereby uh, I'm asking people that to be come, on, come on board and be prayer warriors for us, meaning lots of people to pray for the event, to pray for people who are having physical problems and are asking the Lord to help. He, he, he won't help everybody because he has his own plan. We, we look through the universe and see a very small window. He sees the whole universe, so he has a plan. But for whatever reason, your prayers to him have been answered. And he said, John, you're cancer free. You are cancer free for whatever purpose that's going to be. You and the Lord will figure that out. I'm sure nobody else can tell you about that one. But that's, that's awesome. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on Stories That Matter. John, thanks for being here. Thank you. Stories That Matter, the journey of life from